This video is brought to you by Avoto, a professional AI photo editor that allows you to perform routine tasks quickly and sync your edits with other photos in just seconds. As portrait photographers, almost all of us want to create gorgeous close-ups and the go-to gear for this type of work has long been a beauty dish. Despite using them for many years, I've never felt entirely confident that I was doing it right. After years of just winging it, I wanted to thoroughly test them out in order to better understand how they work and how to use them. So in this video today, I'm going to share with you the results of my tests, and then I'm going to guide you through two multi-light setups using beauty dishes. Before we get started, I just want to give you my disclosures up front. Ellen Crumb did provide me with some of the gear that I'm using today, and I have written about this topic for their website, but they did not pay me to make this video, and they don't have editorial control over its content. Beauty dishes from different brands will probably work substantially the same, but I would encourage you to perform the same tests which I'm doing on your gear. But after watching this video, you will know what to look out for and expect when using beauty dishes, socks, and grids. If you want to help support me to make more videos like this, please click on the links in the description to check out and possibly purchase some of the gear that I'm using today. I would also really appreciate it if you would like, subscribe, and sign up for the bell. In addition, I'll be using the terms reflectors and beauty dishes interchangeably. If you have ever heard anything about beauty dishes, you've probably heard and encountered the adage that diameter equals distance. It's a handy rule of thumb. Position the beauty dish from the subject's face at a distance that's equal to the modifier's diameter. So, if it's 27 inches across, place it 27 inches from their face. While I followed this principle over the years, I often wondered if I was really doing the right thing. I've asked manufacturers what they thought the distance should be, only to be told, do whatever looks the most beautiful. Other people have sworn that one meter is somehow the optimal distance. Thus, when I got my hands on all four of Ellen Chrome's beauty dishes, I seized the opportunity to definitively determine the best practices while using these reflectors. All beauty dishes feature a deflector disc in the middle of the reflector, ensuring that the subject cannot directly see the bare flash tube. Ellen Chrome utilizes this umbrella hole in the middle of their non-OCF lights to secure the deflectors. Plus, they offer photographers a choice between translucent, opaque, that's white, silver, or gold deflectors. This design means that all of Ellen Chrome's lights, except for the one and the three, are compatible with their beauty dishes. However, the ELB 500 will require the Quadra reflector adapter. The opaque deflector allows some direct light to pass through, diffusing it within the modifier. The translucent variant accomplishes this to a lesser extent. The silver and gold deflectors completely block direct light, with the gold one warming up the overall output. Other brands like Mola use a mesh metal disc by default, and Profoto uses a solid disc. But if you come across brands with choices for which deflector you use, now you'll sort of have an idea as to how those work. For all of my technical tests, I use an Ellen Chrome opaque deflector because I thought that it would be the most neutral choice. In the past, I found that I liked the opal frosted glass disc in my Mola Beauty dish, so when I got my first Ellen Chrome dish, I started using the opaque deflector because it seemed familiar, and I never looked back. So you might though find that you would like the silver one. Instead, it's really up to you. For years, I believed that light came out of a beauty dish in the shape of a cone because it would bounce off the back of the reflector. So let's say that uh, this is our beauty dish and it's pointed that way, just, so the, just for the sake that you can sort of understand what I'm saying. I thought that the light emanated from the flash tube, that it then hit the back of the beauty dish and came forward. And I also believed that it hit the sides of the beauty dish and the rim and then bounced off at like a 45 degree angle and came back towards the subject. So again, if this is our beauty dish and it's pointed that way, the light's going to come off the flash tube, go to the back and go forward and come off the flash tube and go to the sides and go forward. 
So that made me believe that this adage that diameter equals distance seemed to make sense because it felt like the light was coming off of the sides and the rim of the beauty dish at about 45 degrees and going forward. So I could have made a video today with a bunch of pretty pictures and I could have given you advice based on my feelings or things that I heard from people, but I felt like what I told you today should be rooted in some sort of evidence. So I tried to come up with an idea as to how I could test and show you if this cone thing was actually what was happening when light came out of the beauty dish. And so I started to think about it for a while and I got this epiphany that if I took a piece of black foam core and I put it perpendicular to the face of a beauty dish and then photographed it, that I should be able to capture a cross section of the light rays. And so I set everything up and I took a picture of it and, and I was really surprised that it actually worked. So I compared the 70 centimeter or 27.6 inch soft light silver beauty dish reflector from Ellenchrome. I also photographed, or I actually, I also test, tested the white version of that 70 centimeter dish. Then I tested their 44 centimeter, 17.3 inch silver beauty dish and their 44 centimeter, 17.3 inch white beauty dish. I just wanna say one more time that yes, I am specifically using the Ellen Chrome dishes today because those are the dishes or those are the lights that I use and the dishes that I have. But I don't think that your brand of beauty dish is probably going to function significantly differently. I have used the Mola ones before. I didn't do the cross section test with them, but I did use them at diameter equals distance for the Mola Dimmy. And I had the Pro Photo uh, Beauty Dish before, and I could see when I turned the modeling light on with my Pro Heads, just in case you were wondering, I could see how um, there was a cone or direct hot spot in the middle from uh, the reflector. So uh, that did make sense. So I do think that what I'm saying today in evaluating the Ellen Chrome lights is going to carry over uh, to other brands, but I would of course encourage you to check it out uh, for yourself and confirm that what I'm saying is true uh, for your gear. When looking at these images, it's evident that these modifiers actually generate a distinctive Y-shaped beam rather than the cone that I was expecting to show you. This Y shape is more pronounced with the higher contrast silver reflectors. Looking back, I think the results might have been even more distinct with the higher contrast silver deflector, but the shape is still clear. The tape measure helps us determine that the tip of the cone, or in this case the Y, is about 54 centimeters or 21 inches from the silver reflector and around 70 centimeters or 27 inches from the 70 centimeter white reflector. But it's hard to be sure given the contrast. When looking at the results from the 44 centimeter reflectors, it seemed like the lines converged at 44 centimeters, 17 inches with the silver beauty dish and maybe around 35 centimeters or 14 inches with the white beauty dish. Venturing beyond the point where the diagonal lines converge primarily captures rays from the back of the beauty dish while getting too close puts you in the shadow of the deflector disc. Moving on, I experimented with grids on the modifiers revealing that the light is distinctly confined to a column indicating that the diagonal beams are indeed blocked, but more on that a little bit later. After removing the grids, I attach the diffusion sock, and as expected, this accessory scatters the light in all directions. And initially, I thought this light would resemble that from a similarly sized softbox. However, when I tested it with a 70 centimeter, 27.5 inch Rotolux Deep Octabox, I found that the fall off was more abrupt with the beauty dishes, but that there wasn't much of a difference beyond about 30 centimeters or 12 inches. When using a beauty dish, you will typically want to have your modifier directly over the camera pointed downwards with the center of the modifier and the convergence of the diagonal light rays pointed in the middle of the model's face. Otherwise, the light on the face may be uneven. You might end up with a really bright forehead or a really bright mouth. Maybe you want that. I don't know. 
You don't have to use the modifiers this way, but it is how they are used most of the time. I like to tilt my beauty dishes downward at about 45 degrees, but you may like to use them at a different angle. However, using them at a steep angle like 60 degrees might result in a triangular shaped shadow on the neck, which you can see here on the right in this example. If you move the light even higher and angle it down even more, that could result in the absence of a catch light, which is a reflection of the light in the model's eye, and this is typically seen as a mistake. Considering my cross-section test results, I opted to use the bare 70 centimeter silver modifier in a test with Sophia. I placed it at 46, 54, 62, and 70 centimeters, that's 18 inches, 21 inches, 24 inches, and 27 inches away from the model's face so that I could observe the differences. Although the cross-section test suggested that 54 centimeters or 21 inches would be ideal, I wanted to create an image closer to the modifier, and I also wanted to create an image at a distance that was equal to its diameter. I chose the silver beauty dish over the white one because the cross-section results with the silver reflector were so distinctive. When looking at these images of Sophia, you can see that specularity increased as the distance increased. The lighting appeared more flat at 45 centimeters, more three-dimensional at 62 centimeters, and the shadows were more defined at 70 centimeters. Testing the same modifier at the same distances with Anelia, the lighting on her face looked flattering overall. At 46 centimeters, it looked nice, but it was most three-dimensional at 54 centimeters, and her face appeared more narrow at 70 centimeters. Conducting similar tests with the 44 centimeter silver reflector at distances of 28, 36, 44, and 51 centimeters, that's 11, 14, 17, and 20 inches, the light appeared more isolated overall. Sophia looked flat at 28 centimeters, with contrast being nice at around 44 centimeters, but the shadows seemed deepest at 51 centimeters. Reviewing Anelia's photos, the contrast was lower at 28 centimeters, the image was most three-dimensional at 44 centimeters, and her face looked narrower with more shadowing on the sides at 51 centimeters. On set, she reacted very positively to the last image, and although the technical performance might be more optimal on the third image, because that's where the lines cross, I think people in general re will react differently to the light based on the shape of the subject's face. By the way, my college economics professor said that the answer was usually where the lines cross. From these tests, I would conclude that you can't go wrong with diameter equals distance. A little closer might be better for faces like Sophia's, but for faces like Anelia, further away may be preferred. Just know that contrast will be low when it's close to the deflector and inside the lines of convergence. And the shadows will be more abrupt when the reflector is further away from the subject. This makes sense because another rule of thumb is that the smaller the modifier looks to the model, the harsher the light will be. As for the white reflectors, I would expect that the contrast would be lower than the images from the silver dishes based on general experience and a test I did recently with umbrellas. Therefore, I would expect to see the same differences that we observed with the silver beauty dishes, but that those differences are going to be a lot more subtle with white dishes. Maybe the small silver one would be best for a young model, and the large white one would be good for a close-up with an older subject. Alternatively, you could base your decision on whether you want a dramatic image with lots of shadows, that would be the small silver uh, reflector, or you might want to have a light and airy portrait with high contrast, and then you might pick the white 27-inch uh, or 70-centimeter beauty dish. I can't say conclusively that you should follow a particular formula, but I think we now sort of understand a lot better what's going on with these modifiers and how we might inform our artistic decisions moving forward. And again, if you have a different brand, I would encourage you to test them out as well and at least do the cross-section test so that you can see where those lines converge with your particular modifier. And actually, if you do perform that test with your modifier, it would be great if you could uh, put the results down below so that we could share that information with more people who are using different brands of lighting. You know, because diameter might not equal distance for you, 
but that is the rule of thumb we've often been told to follow. And after my test, it seems like that's pretty true. I would also encourage you to try out Avoto, today's sponsor. The program allows you to quickly retouch the skin, remove flyaways, add contouring, de-wrinkle clothing, and more. Plus, all of your changes can be synced with other photos and saved as a preset, so you can finish your editing lightning fast. I retouched this image of Anelia in less than two minutes. So please click on the link in the description to claim a special offer from Avoto. I wanted to simulate photographing in a small room with the 70 centimeter silver beauty dish in order to see whether or not light would just bounce everywhere. I also wanted to learn how distance and the use of grids affected the brightness of the background. After moving Sophia over to the green wall set that I have in my studio, I constructed a small room, if you will, out of two V-flats acting as my walls and a large white foam board on top simulating a ceiling. You can see right away that the distance you place your subject from the background has a huge impact on the luminance of your backdrop. Positioning the model about 2.4 meters or 8 feet away will produce a fairly dark background. The neutral green wall appears almost completely black. Adding the grid makes the backdrop even darker and the shadows on her face become even deeper. After moving her 1.2 meters or 4 feet from the wall, the background looks a little brighter, but it still is very dark. After I put the grid on, you can see that the shadows on her face are more dramatic and the area behind her at the bottom, that's exactly where the light was pointed, became brighter and the upper half of the wall became darker. I believe this happens because the grid blocks the diagonal beams and all of the light is coming from the back of the modifier moving forward. So you're not getting those cross lines that are going to different parts of the room. It's just coming right out of the back and going in a direct beam. That's what we saw in the cross section test. And you also can see evidence of it here in this extreme close up of her eyes. On the left, we have an image without the grid. And on the right, we have an image with the grid. And you can see how the shape is totally different. Also, if we're adding the grid and we're blocking those diagonal beams, we're probably reducing the contouring on the face and that's sort of defeating the purpose of using a beauty dish. After talking to a few friends, I decided to do one more test and that was to take my mannequin head, Sia, and place her into a white corner and then use a beauty dish off axis and see if having the grid controlled the light. As you can see in this side by side, using the grid had a huge impact on the final results. The light from these modifiers appears to be very focused and I'm not really seeing a compelling case for using the grids other than darkening the clothing on access and controlling the light when off access. But please let me know in the comments below how you feel about them after looking at these tests and from your own experience. For this image with Sophia, I chose to use a 44 centimeter silver beauty dish with a silver deflector as my main light. I placed this modifier 17 inches from her face. When using a light source that is this focused, you want to communicate to your subject that they have to stay in the same general position throughout the photo shoot. Otherwise, they're going to end up outside of your beam of light and they're gonna fall, uh, end up being in the shadows. So their face is gonna end up really dark and then you're gonna to have to correct it. To add depth and separate Sophia from the background, I introduced a light with a 21 centimeter, eight inch reflector with barn doors and a 20 degree grid inside. This setup cast a narrow band of light across the middle of the backdrop. My camera was set to 1 200th at F8 at ISO 100. Initially, I used a white backdrop However, I felt that it lacked character and it just ended up looking a little too gray and too muddled. So I swiftly switched it to a black backdrop and then I increased the power of that background light. I noticed then that her hair was blending into the top of the background and so I introduced an Ellen Chrome 1 with a 21 centimeter, eight inch reflector and I used that as my hair light with a diffusion dome on the Ellen Chrome 1. I set this light to minimum power, but unfortunately the light was too bright. So to balance the light in the scene, I increased the power of the other lights one stop, and then I stopped down from F8 to F11. 
Next, I felt like her black clothing was blending into the background, so I placed an Elenchrome Indirect Light Mode of Strip softbox that's 33 centimeters by 175 centimeters or 13 by 69 inches over each shoulder next to the backdrop. As light passes through diffusion fabric, it warms up, so I remove the outer layer of diffusion on these softboxes so the light would be the same color temperature as the light from the other modifiers. What's unique about these particular softboxes is that the lights point away from the subject, that's why they're called indirect. It bounces around on the inside of the softbox and then comes forward towards your subject. So you don't have to worry about hot spots, the light's really even. I turned the power up of these modifiers until I started to see some edge lighting on her clothing, but I couldn't turn them up too high because that would blow out her blonde hair. Alternatively, you could use any of Ellen Chrome Strip softboxes without the diffusion and a silver deflector inside, or if you use a different brand of gear altogether and you have a strip softbox with two layers of diffusion inside, just take the outer layer of diffusion off and that way your light will pass through that first layer. It'll sort of bounce around on the silver fabric and come forward and that'll crisp up your light a little bit as well. Or you could just use a standard seven inch grid reflector that's about 18 uh, centimeters. You know, the light, the reflector that usually comes with your light, that'll give you high contrast light. But the reason why I chose to use these very large indirect strip softboxes is because the light is really even from top to bottom. So that's something to think about as well. Also, another thing to think about is I probably wouldn't have needed these edge lights at all had I just used gray paper. But unfortunately, I ran out a few months ago and I keep forgetting to order a new roll. The clamshell setup is widely recognized as one of the most popular ways to use a beauty dish. It features a main light positioned above your camera and a fill source below. For this setup with Colleen, I boomed a white beauty dish 27 inches or 70 centimeters above the camera and pointed down. Then I placed a second light below my camera with a standard 8.3 inch or 21 centimeter reflector pointed up at her face. Now for your fill, you could use a light or you could use a reflector. It's very common for people to use a one by three or 30 by 90 centimeter strip softbox below the camera pointed up at the person to fill in the shadows. It's also very common for people to use a, um, just like a, a 50 by 75 centimeter white card, uh, or that's like a 20 by 30 inch piece of foam board. I'm sure I did the metric conversion wrong, but just having something white there in order to bounce light back up. I have something white in front of me right now that's bouncing light up. I don't have a light down here, uh, but sometimes I have before. So that's just something to think about. Having the light gives you control over the overall brightness of your shadows, whereas using the card just means that you don't have to uh, own another light and um, you only need to spend $3 for it. So those are some trade-offs. Another trade-off is when you have a really wide fill source, that's going to bounce light in, or in the case of a strip softbox, that's going to shine light into the shadows on the side of the person's face because it's going to wrap around. And that's going to um, really reduce your contrast overall. If you want to maintain contrast, but get some fill under the neck here, under the chin here, then you could use a seven inch or eight inch reflector like I'm using in this setup with Colleen to just target that light like right in the middle. And then the contouring that's happening on the side of the face won't be um, filled in. So that's something to think about. If you're trying to uh, photograph an older person, a lot of times you'll wanna use more fill in order to fill in the wrinkles. And if you're photographing a younger person, you'll probably wanna use less fill overall. So with that older person, you might want to start off with having your main light and your fill light, if it's an active light, um, be of equal brightness on the person's face. So what I mean by that is if you're holding a light meter, or if you have a light meter, you want to hold it here and you want to point it up at the main light. And let's say it meters at 5.6, you want to then uh, turn it down towards the, the fill light and you wanna meter that and have that meter at 5.6 as well. If you, and, and maybe when you're photographing that younger person, you might want that to be 5.6 and that to be 2.8 to start with. And that may get you sort of into the ballpark, so to speak, and then you can season to taste 
by shooting some test photos and then seeing if it's too bright or too dark. So if you don't have a light meter and you're just winging it, maybe set the power of both, you know, a softbox below and a beauty dish above, maybe set them to the same. I'm not really sure if that's going to work, but let's just say, try something like that. If you feel like they're being lit from below with a flashlight, turn that fill source down. If you feel like the shadows are too dark, turn it up. It's really kind of that easy. But let me talk more about this setup with Colleen. You'll see that I have this eight inch reflector as my fill light right below and it's in line with the camera. And that's on purpose because if that light were slightly off to the side, I would end up in a situation like, let's say it's over here, it's gonna fill in this side of her face more. And if it's over here, it's gonna fill in that side more. And that's gonna look very asymmetrical and it's just going to look bad overall. So whether you're using a small light down there, with a the small light, it's really critical, or you're using a one by three strip softbox, or you're using a white card, uh, you wanna have it in the middle. And one thing I forgot to talk about is you can also use a three meter uh, reflector as well. Just know that if you use a silver reflector, it's going to be punchier, like we've seen with the silver beauty dish. And if you use a white one, it's going to be more subtle. So the white one will have less contrast and the silver one will have more contrast. Specifically with this fill light that I was using with Colleen, I put it down at minimum power and it actually ended up being too bright. So I backed it up more under the camera and even beyond the camera uh, so that I would have it be the right brightness that I wanted, which I believe was two stops darker uh, than her face. Alternatively, instead of using this 8.3 inch or 21 centimeter reflector, I could have maybe not used a reflector at all, or I could have used a seven inch reflector and that would have been less efficient and that would have made the light darker. You could also use a neutral density filter in this case to make it darker as well. If you are using this fill light bare bulb, there is something though that you have to consider, and that is that your fill light may bounce all around the room, and when light bounces off of colored things, it reflects that color back into your scene. So if you're in a blue room, like I am right now, you probably uh, don't wanna do that. So just keep that in mind. Where you place your light in relation to your subject matters a lot too. If it's too far under them coming up, then they're going to end up with a brighter chest and maybe brighter hands than a brighter uh, jawline. So having it in front of them, coming up at them, you know, at maybe at, at this kind of angle, that's gonna look a lot better in the final results. So in general, place it under your main light and as high as you can without it being in your frame. In this setup, I also added a hair light to create a little separation between her hair and the background. I used a grid on this modifier to make sure that the light didn't brighten the top half of my backdrop. Then to finish off the image, I added a strip softbox on both sides of the backdrop to brighten it up a bit. I likely could have avoided using the three lights in the back if I chose a lighter background color or moved Colleen closer to the backdrop. Hopefully you've learned a lot from this video today. I know that I learned a lot from the technical test. Remember how I thought that there was a cone of light coming out of the beauty dish and then it turned out to be the Y? Just remember when you're going forward and thinking about using these dishes that there is that convergence of the diagonal lines and that's probably about where you want to put the person's face. And so that's why that rule of diameter equals distance is pretty much that's why we have that rule and that's why we use it and that your mileage may vary with your particular brand of lights so i would again encourage you to test them out and at least do the cross section test to sort of see if that's where the lines cross because that's what my uh, college professor said was usually where the answer lies just remember that the silver beauty dishes are going to be more dramatic overall than the white ones and the small ones are going to be more dramatic than the big ones so that's something to keep in mind too when we did our small space test, we learned that the light is extremely focused from these modifiers and using the grids may cause a gradient on the backdrop when shooting on axis, but it will control the light when shooting off axis. However, using a grid is going to have a significant impact on the character of the light on your subject's face. If you enjoy learning from me in this video today, there are ways that you can take things to the next level. I have three lighting handbooks that you can purchase and download today. 
Each one will guide you through the process of recreating over 20 different lighting setups, and they can be found at johngress.com slash lighting handbooks. You could also sign up for a three-day free trial on my online exclusive members-only learning platform, the Academy with John Gress, where you will find hours of exclusive tutorials and get access to two live monthly Q&A and critique sessions. More info can be found at johngress.com slash academy. If you'd like to learn from me in person, I'll also be teaching workshops throughout the year, and you can find more information at johngress.com slash workshops. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions or comments, just leave those below. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you soon.